Hello, my name is Harriet Wenberg and I am a trustee of the Georgian Group, having been appointed just about a year ago. And um, I'm very pleased to be able to speak to you um, about Verdmont House in Bermuda with Georgian, Georgian history and Georgian connections. Just a little bit about Bermuda um, to begin with, for those of you who aren't familiar with the, with the islands. Um, they are an archipelago about 600 miles off the coast of North Carolina and remain a, a British overseas dependency now. Um, they were settled originally in 1612 by the British and there was no native population. There had been um, some Spanish shipwrecks there previously. They were discovered by Juan de Bermudez um, in, the, in the later 16th century. So the, the, the British settlers once arrived, initially built houses and other buildings using a, a wattle and daub form of, of architecture, but that fairly quickly migrated into limestone and lime wash by the later 17th century, um, initially for civic buildings, but then also for houses. And that was primarily because Waddle and Dobb didn't stand up terribly well to the extremely humid conditions, to the damp conditions, and also to the fact that uh, hurricanes were to be relied upon every year to, to, to blow through. This that we're looking at here is a, a map of the islands that was, uh, that, was, that was drafted by Lieutenant Thomas Hurd of the, of the Royal Navy and it was, it was drawn between 1789 and 1797, um, which is quite an impressive feat. The, the, the original is 13 feet by nine. It's in the archives at Kew and heard the tools that he had available to him, obviously not um, in a period of aerial photography, was a, a, a rowboat and a, and, a, and a plumb line for depth measurement. And this was to show very accurately Bermuda's outlying reef system, which was precisely what had caused the, the shipwrecks that, um, that had found Spanish on Bermuda initially, and then also the British later, prior to settlement in 1612. Moving on to Verdmont, the, the house, um, it was completed round about 1710, 1712 for a privateer by the name of John Dickinson. And Verdmont is, is amongst the earliest surviving formal houses in the British colonies. And certainly for its time, it represents a very big, a very sophisticated building venture for quite a far flung part of the world. So Verdmont reads as, as Georgian, despite if completion was in 1712, predating the first King George just by two years. And for Bermuda, it's also a, a rare example of a transitional style. So it still is retaining some of the features of earlier 17th century um, limestone architecture, um, but also anticipating the, the classicism of the, the Georgian 18th century to come. So unlike a lot of other buildings of this period in, in, in Bermuda and, and elsewhere too, Verdmont has remained really largely structurally unchanged for the intervening 300 years. So it's still much in terms of footprint, precisely as it was when originally completed. And that's interior as well as exterior. It is uh, one of the best known of Bermuda's houses and is thought of as being very characteristic, despite in many ways its, its form and its disposition really running counter to the norm for what Bermudian architecture and Bermuda houses were, typically in the 18th and 19th centuries, but it has created this very enduring image of, of what, a, what a Bermudian house is and looks like. This is a view um, from, the, from the upper story, from the first floor of Verdmont, just to give the sense of the position that the house had. So Verdmont's position at the top of the hill was chosen specifically so that the owner could feel that she or he had really ownership of, of the entire visible world. So at that time, it would have been uninterrupted views to the south shore of Bermuda in the Atlantic Ocean beyond. And that, that, that sighting at the top of the hill being exposed was unusual for a time when people would have been looking to build in more sheltered locations, knowing that hurricanes were, were to be, you know, they, they, they would come each year. Um, but this really being um, the, a situation that was, that was useful for John Dickinson, a privateer, as I mentioned, because he could keep an eye on shipping traffic, what was coming in and what was going out to be able to deter any, any attempts at tax evasion. So a very privileged advantage and outlook. Verdmont followed um, in, its, in its original setup, the, the English model of, of a state building and initially had 93 acres of land and a walled garden, which is a lot of land for, for an island Bermuda, which is only 22 square miles in total. Um, but this, you know, despite following the English model, it was all done at a local scale and with local materials. So small islands, meaning smaller houses and a great deal of garden space for, for the size of Bermuda. 
the Dickinson family owned and lived in Vermont for 150 years, the first 150 years of its history. And um, slaves are known certainly to have been on the estate for at least 120 of those years and not very many records survive. So at this point, not, not enough is known, but that's a, an imbalance that under the Bermuda National Trust is, is looking to, to redress at the moment. Um, Dickinson himself bought the land in 1694 and the house, as I mentioned earlier, thought to have been completed 1710 to 1712, was certainly under construction from 1696 and was certainly completed by 1714 and um, because that in that year um, John Dickinson died and the inventory that was left detailed certainly a, a completed house and outbuildings. To say a little bit of the, the money that actually built Verdmont, this very sophisticated building project um, for, for, for the time in this part of the world, um, John Dickinson's wife, Elizabeth's first husband, and also Elizabeth's father were shareholders in a Bermuda sloop called the Amity, which undertook what became really quite an infamous and extremely profitable voyage that was initially set up as a privateering expedition and certainly turned more to, to piracy out in Arabian seas where a Captain Thomas II, who you can see with a very long pipe in the image on, on the right, um, boarded a, a, an, an Arab ship and enough was, was taken that um, certainly by records, I've seen that shareholders received 14 times the value of the ship back to them. So it was an extremely profitable venture. The image on the left shows a, a Bermuda sloop, Bermuda being um, very prominent in shipbuilding at this time and doing lots of one mastered very, very fast sailing ships. The Bermuda sloops um, actually continuing to be a specific design of, of very fast sailing boat. And because the, the, the money for the Dickinson's building venture at Broadmont uh, had, had come from the Amity, there was a local record at the time in a, in a letter um, quoting that Arabian gold showed its face on the island for a while, notwithstanding the efforts of its first recipients to be discreet. So it was reasonably widely known how the money had come to build Broadmont. Um, Dickinson and, and his wife Elizabeth were both influenced by international trends in architecture. As ship owners, they had, they had traveled to places like New England, the Chesapeake and the Caribbean. But really beyond that, not much is known about John Dickinson, um, apart from the fact that he did send the first collection of Bermudian plants to, to London to form part of the Sloan Herbarium and predecessor of the Chelsea Physic Garden. So the house still has its original footprint, as I, as I mentioned, it, it has um, structurally largely remained unchanged in the 300 years of its, of its existence. And also once lime wash was being applied to the exterior of limestone buildings, um, it wasn't long before some natural pigments were also being added to that. So houses had, had color effectively from quite an early date and it was natural pigment, it was what was available, um, but typically chosen to, to match some of the local flowers which is a tradition that, that continues more or less even to this day. So um, the paintwork analysis on Broadmont, um, I haven't seen in, in the greatest of detail, but it is, I think it is expected that Broadmont would have had color applied to its walls, its exterior walls from quite an early date. Broadmont is also um, quite a nice quote about it, symmetrical in intent, but not in execution. Um, so the front door is several inches out of true centre and the back door, as you can see here, is way off of centre. And that's to account for a three-storey Bermuda cedar staircase that's inside in the, in the hall. That means the door has to be positioned um, over to the side. An inventory from 1714, so at the, at the moment of John Dickinson's death, um, details a, a detached kitchen storeroom, privy, outroom and buttery for servants' lodging as well as a cabin for wood. And this has more latterly been known as, as Verdmont Cottage, which sort of belies the, the legacy of slavery associated with these buildings. But those are, are intact and remain part of the, the Verdmont property. The main house itself had four rooms on each of two floors. So a very rational design, referencing back to the, the symmetrical intent that Verdmont has. Um, it also had four chimneys, so two on each side, and they're very sturdy and they're very projecting, which is typical of, of Bermudian construction. And the idea with that being that a chimney that was, in many cases, you could have quite a, quite a small house with a chimney very outsized to the size of the house, with the idea being that that provided um, additional warmth in the cooler winter months, Bermuda not being in the Caribbean, it does have a, 
reasonably cool winter, but also as as defence in in um, periods of hurricanes that that chimneys would act almost as buttresses with their their size and their weight. So with that many chimneys um, and that many fire, it allowed for a fireplace in each of the eight rooms, the four on the ground floor and the four on the first floor. And that's also very unusual in early Bermudian houses. And in part, it, it came to be known that that was unnecessary, that you didn't need quite that many fireplaces because you never needed quite that much heat. Um, several of the mouldings around fireplaces that, that remain in the house are of Bermuda cedar and, and are original to the house itself. And there's an image of one of those that will come later. The windows, as you can see there, are, are a single hung sash and they're 12 over 12. The abundance of glazing bars was possibly something that was helpful um, if there were strong winds um, battering the house and its exposed location. Much of the windows actually are original. They've been repaired significantly over the last 300 years. It's, it's also worth pointing out that the, the masonry frames that go around the, on the exterior of the house the top and the sides of the windows, that is very unusual um, for Bermuda House to, to have that sort of masonry trim around the windows. And on this image again, just to point out that um, by the time the, the Bermuda National Trust was, um, was the owner of the house in the 1950s, uh, there was a, a projecting porch on the front that had been put on in the 19th century, so Victorian construction projecting quite a large porch and that was replaced um, in the 1950s by an architect called Wilfred Onions with the one that you can see on the house today, taking it back to something slightly more in keeping with the house's original design. Um, so the double pile plan of the house, having a room opposite the front and the back would really have vexed Bermuda roof builders at this time that a single pile was, was a, much easier, a much easier width to span with one of these masonry roofs. Um, the roof has been heavily restored in the last 300 years. It, it's sustained damage, it's needed repairs for all sorts of reasons. This, the two-tiered design that you can see here as well, um, that's, that is very unusual to the house. It's not original and it's a change that was made later um, and doesn't exist really on many other Bermudian properties. So this all referencing that Verdmont really creating the image of a Bermudian house, but quite a lot about it actually being quite unique and distinct to, to Verdmont. Worth digressing momentarily, not just to show this um, really beautiful photograph, but to talk about the Bermudian roof and its role in, in Bermudian life and also in, in um, currently really as an element of sustainable design that could be exported to other parts of the world. Um, so the idea being because Bermuda has no fresh water at all, um, rainwater has to be caught to have drinking water. So there is a, 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 a by, by law now all new construction has to be able to, to catch and to trap its own rainwater um, for drinking and other, and other purposes. Um, so it's originally would have been a, a limestone tile that was built up in this stepped formation and then a guttering system put circling around the outside of the roof to, to, to channel the water around the roof and then down a pipe into a tank that sits underneath the house or near the house outside. And with lime wash being applied obviously fairly routinely in, in coats on the roof, that acting as a, as a natural disinfectant as well. So quite an ingenious solution and one that means that Bermuda retains this very distinctive appearance architecturally because a house built in 2020 would have the same style roof that, that Verdmont has on it from, from 17, 1712. Coming inside the house now, so entry is directly into the hall, which is usual for, for a lot of houses of this period and the three-story um, Bermuda Cedar staircase that I mentioned is, is, um, is what you see here. It's quite a simple hall at the time, and certainly now in terms of presentation with chairs and tables and a few pictures on the wall. Um, on the left, you can see a newel cap that's been removed. So that I think is the only one that removes now, but a century ago or, or, or more, they would all have, have been removable so that they could be replaced by um, a, a candle, a lantern effectively that inserted in the same place to light the way upstairs at night. In the principal two rooms on the, on the ground floor for, for entertaining, and there were double doors added between them um, to allow them to become one big room. So showing that Birdmont was had plans to do some quite serious entertaining, the owners and occupants of Birdmont. And this, the connecting two rooms that way with doors to allow them to allow um, the creation of one very big room is certainly an early, um, if not the earliest example of, of this in Bermuda and a very early example even 
um, even for the United States at the time. Um, so there's evidence that's been found of early colored paint on, on woodwork, the interior woodwork here, um, in a vibrant green, a medium blue, and a reddish brown. And there's also evidence of early wallpaper, um, which would have been applied to, the, to these wide planks of Georgia pine on the walls that you can see in this, in this photograph here. And um, the planks and the wallpaper were, were installed in the mid 18th century. And at that same time, the, the cornice molding and the paneled shutters that you can see were, were also added. The use of the, of the rooms within Verdmont um, were able to, to change to suit families and, and fashions over the centuries of its occupation. So this upstairs bedchamber, for example, originally a bedchamber in the 19th century became an upstairs parlor for some amount of of entertaining, and that is one of the um, Bermuda cedar um, chimney piece or mouldings round round the fireplace opening that are original to the house. So the portraits that that hang in Verdmont are the only pieces now in the house thought to have been there in the 18th century, and they're of a, a, a Thomas Smith and his four daughters, Mary, Honora, Elizabeth, and Catherine. And Thomas Smith, connecting back to the Dickinson line, was married to the granddaughter and the heir of John Dickinson. So this is we're still in the in the Dickinson ownership um, period. And these portraits were painted in the house between 1765 and 1775 by the Honourable John Green, who was a loyalist judge and a portrait painter from Philadelphia. And John Green, subsequently to painting these portraits, actually married Mary Smith and lived at Verdmont himself. The furniture that you can see in this, in this photograph and other, other furniture that's in the house was assembled by the Bermuda National Trust in the 1950s after the house came into its care. And much of it is made of, of Bermuda cedar and would have been crafted on the island by local cabinet makers between 1700 and 1820. And so quite a few shipbuilders had ended up on Bermuda, many of them obviously occupied in shipbuilding, so creating the, the very fast sloops, but many getting into cabinet making as well. And, the, the dovetail joint is the is the signature trademark um, for any cabinet maker of Bermuda of this of this period. They all had a slightly different way of of completing their dovetail joints. And um, some of the some of the furniture at Verdmont and others has has what's known as marching legs, um, where the the outturned feet all face forward into the room, making it look as though the piece of furniture is sort of advancing and marching into the room. And that's quite a quite a fun sort of whimsical style that um, that is thought to have developed almost uniquely in Bermuda. And to show here, this is a piece that, that is actually in, a, in another collection on the island, but um, despite the slightly dark wood at the bottom, you can just about see that those are marching legs. This is a, an early cedar chest. Um, worth mentioning actually too, that if anyone wants, um, wants such things are possible again, um, to be in Bermuda and actually to go to Verdmont for a visit firsthand, um, John Cox, who's pictured here dissecting a, um, a box on a writing desk downstairs in, in Verdmont, is very often there and is one of the, the greatest historians of the house and a, and a very, very great guide. So it would be a, a wonderful thing to, to go and to meet John there. To sort of the end of the, of the house's inhabited history, um, it, it was it eventually passed to a, a Rupert Spencer um, together the house with by then just 50 acres down from the 93 that it originally had when Dickinson purchased the land and built the house. And from Rupert Spencer, it, it ended with his great niece, a Miss Lillian Joel, who's pictured on the, on the left in this photograph. And you can see the, the Victorian projecting porch um, coming off the house behind the group standing in front of it. And Miss Joel, living at the house, never modernized it. She, she didn't add electricity. She didn't add um, plumbed in water. She cooked on a kerosene stove. Um, she used oil lamps and candles, and she continued to dip for water in the tank outside the house. So as I described, water running down the roof, going through the sterilization process of, of being exposed to the lime wash, ending in the tank. And from there, Lily and Joel would, would dip for it and bring it into the house um, for cooking and washing and so forth. Um, so it was Miss Joel's family who, after her death, um, sold the house to the Bermuda Historical Monuments Trust, which was the forerunner of the, the Bermuda National Trust. And it, it was opened as a museum originally in, in 1956. So quite a long history now as being with the Bermuda National Trust and, and open to the public and a wonderful um, and, and very authentic space in which to display 
um, the portraits done in the house, but also a number of pieces of, of, of really beautiful Bermudian furniture as well. Um, two sites to recommend where you could find more about Vaudemont and, and some more images as well. And one is the Bermuda National Trust's website, which is bnt.bm. Um, and each uh, parish in Bermuda also has those, there's a, a book or a forthcoming book on the architectural history of each of those parishes, which is put out also by the Bermuda National Trust. And those you can also find online through their website. And the book on Smith's Parish is where, is where you'll find Vaudemont. And uh, so I hope it's been, yes, I hope it's been interesting for those of you watching this to have a, an initial look at Verdmont and at a, at a Bermudian house um, and a nice retreat out of, out of the, the space that was questioned in doing much online to, to a house that I, I hope many of you will have the chance to visit in person. Thank you very much.